Oh, that was easy. And the guy tapping on things over there is Tom Calloway. So we, uh, we both work at Red Hat. I'm on a team called Open Source and Standards uh, and work largely with Fedora, and he's the Fedora engineering manager. And uh, Raspberry Pi isn't really our job, but it's awesome. So uh, <laughs> more relevantly, I suppose, we are theoretically finished writing a book called Raspberry Pi Hacks that'll come out in December. And so the first half of this talk, uh, I'm kind of glad that only like three of you have actually built something, because we're going to walk you through some of the basic Pi stuff. Uh, if, if words like soft float sound like they should involve ice cream, that's okay. Just like glaze over for those parts, and then we'll get to the part of the end where we show you cool things people have built. And that's when the jokes about Captain America are going to come back. So, This is just a picture of a guy with pie on his face. <laughs> and it makes me laugh, so I leave it there. Uh, I usually start with some history of the pie, but uh, how many of you went to Evan's keynote yesterday morning? So we can skip most of that because you heard a much better version from the guy who has the history. Uh, but I will show you this. This is the BBC Micro, the little computer he talked about that he based the Raspberry Pi on that inspired the whole idea for the Raspberry Pi. This came out in 1981 with a 2 megahertz processor, and you had two options. You had a Model A and a Model B, just like with the Raspberry Pi. You could have 16K or 32K of memory. I know. Never, never. Nobody needs that much memory. And this is an ad for it. And you can see it was intended for educational use, just like the Raspberry Pi is designed to. So let's talk about the actual little pie. Mmm, pie. Uh, I'll let Tom go through some of the, the basic descriptions. Unfortunately, it's not called a CSI connector because it gives your camera powers of zoom and enhance. <laughs> If I have a Sharpie, I'll just scratch that out. The picture's a little old. And it's worth noting, so most of the things we'll be talking about, things that you should do, can do, uh, a lot of the projects are built on that more recent Model B version of the Pi, which also has some other cool additions, uh, like mounting holes, which are super handy. Uh, so as you know, the Pi was designed for education, uh, which is super awesome. The idea is keep it cheap, and then you can get it into the hands of kids. And for all of us, that's still super cheap because you have a monitor and you have a keyboard and all those things. <laughs> Unfortunately, a lot of people have noticed that there's a lot of other things that you need that, that aren't always handy. And there are ways to overcome these things. And we'll talk about some of those. But the best part is, if you don't have a lot of stuff, you get to go shopping. Uh, and there are all sorts of places on the internet that will sell you all of these things and all the great toys that you can connect to the Raspberry Pi and all the things that we're going to be talking about. Uh, Adafruit is uh, particularly fantastic. And we talk about them all the time. And it sounds like we sell for Adafruit, but we don't. We just buy all of their things. <laughs> yeah? I want to cut. Uh, the biggest difference on Adafruit, the Pi's 
$39.99 instead of $35. But if you're already buying all the other things, you might as well just go ahead and buy your pies there, and then you save on your shipping. Uh, Element 14 has all the cool stuff, too. They're one of the, uh, the main sellers of the pie. SparkFun is really only useful for weird electronics parts. I kind of think of it as the internet version of what I would like Radio Shack to be. And uh, as for, oh, don't buy pies on Amazon. That's why that bullet is there. They sell for like $50 on Amazon. My neighbor asked me the other day, he's like, I'm going to get on Amazon and get a pie. I was like, no, slow motion, jumping on him. Uh, and your Radio Shack, Radio Shack fantastically varies by the side of town. I was going to say by town, but, but not even. There are three of them near me, and one of them might as well call itself the Arduino store, and another is a cell phone store. Uh, the one that is by the college with the uh, engineering school, particularly fantastic. So that's some of the places you can get stuff, so let's get started. A few basic steps. Your SD card is your hard drive. That's where all of the important things happen. Well, I, not all of the important things, but many of them. And so you want to get the right one. Uh, and these are the steps we're going to go through. I'm, kinda, I'm trying to skim through some of this because I feel like you guys probably already know a lot of this and you want to see cool things. So, uh, Most quality name brand SD cards that you recognize the name of are fine. There was a bug at one time with class 10 cards, which uh, Supposedly has been repaired, but Tom ran into like a week ago. On the other hand, there is one hack in our book that actually requires a class 10 card, so your mileage may vary. Yeah, that eLinux site is your source of everything that you ever wanted to know about anything about the Pi. It's pretty fantastic. I have only found a couple of things that were a little out of date, and it's a wiki, so I suppose the right thing to do would be to go back and update them. Uh, it will tell you that a micro SD card with an adapter won't work, except it does, and that's mostly all we use, and I think that's what Adafruit ships you. So <laughs> don't be afraid of the micro SD card. It's cool. You going to talk about some of the display choices? Yeah. Like the one on your table. There are also some fun creative solutions. Uh, one of my favorites is this guy made something he calls the Kindleberry Pie, where he uses the Kindle for a screen. And the blog post is worth reading for the entertainment, even if you never intend to do it, because he just repeatedly says, this is a stupid idea. You're going to kill your Kindle. It's a stupid idea. But here's how you do it over and over again. Uh, the other cool thing is uh, there used to be this phone called the Motorola Atrix, and there was this $500 attachment called a laptop that gave you a little screen and a keyboard and a battery. and basically turned your phone into a tiny laptop, and now that $500 accessory is like 40 bucks on eBay for this old phone, and it works great with the Pi, and then you have a battery and a screen and a keyboard all in one. And uh, I just got one for my birthday, and I've been laughing because I, I say not every guy could get away, with, get away with giving his wife a three-year-old discontinued piece of cell phone accessory for her birthday. <laughs> Such a lucky man. And you can play with touch screens. And some of these things are, are, particularly like this, are based on our adventures even a year ago with getting stuff to work. I think Adafruit now sells a little, a tiny touch screen. It might actually be meant for Arduino. You can make it work. That's what you're here for, right? Uh, oh, 
Well, there went that joke. <laughs> Paul Kernley things, engineering man. All right, so uh, right now, most of this research is still on the 3.6 kernel. Uh, there are newer kernel branches in the uh, GitHub repository that the Raspberry Pi Foundation puts up. Uh, their code is not merged into the Linux kernel. We hope uh, someday this will be the case, so we will stop having to go track down a separate support tree. Uh, but they do a very good job of keeping it maintained and current. Uh, so basically, you can get that code, uh, clone it, uh, build it, and then you can run the make with your proper command. <laughs> which is so named, the, the kernel has the make Mr. Proper in addition to the make clean target because Mr. Proper is the name of Mr. Clean on the other side of the ocean. Now you know, you learn something a day. So now you have your awesome SD card, you got what you want to put on it, you should, you should pick the right distro. We may be slightly biased towards Pydora, what with Red Hat paying our paychecks and stuff. Uh, we don't produce Pydora, I should add. It, it's a project based out of Seneca College, uh, so we're not actually getting paid to work on it. We just like it because it's based on the thing we're getting paid to work on. But that said, we're also fans of using the thing that is best for what you're doing with it. And so if you're going to set up XBMC, for example, you should use RasBMC because that's what it was designed to do. Uh, Occidentalis is, the, is Adafruit's RasBMC-based distro. Uh, they, they were at first calling it the distro for education, but if you go read their page, it basically says, what this is really for is, is hardware hackers. And... Uh, if none of the following words make sense to you, the, perhaps this distro is not for you. But you have many, many choices, and this is a small fraction of the number of distros that uh, are available in versions for the Pi. And I originally put Plan 9 on this slide because I thought it was amusing, and I have discovered that it is incredibly popular. Uh, but some of them get specific. QD on Pi is for QT apps. That's, so whatever you want to use, there is one for it. But we'll tell you things about Pydora because it's awesome. Uh, I specifically like, when I, when I first read the list of features, because at some point Linux is kind of Linux, uh, the one that caught my eye was if you're running headless, you never have to attach a monitor at all to find out your IP address because you can put this little file in there and it will blink out the IP address through the LEDs and then read it over the speakers in this lovely British accent. <laughs> Which uh, we would demonstrate for you, except that I didn't bring one of those. We, we brought the little screen, you can play with that. Uh, at one point, uh, I'm going to say back about January, somebody created a bootloader so that you could have some choices. And it happened literally the day I gave this talk for the first time. And so right before I gave my talk, I'm like, stick it in the slide. But now there is Noobs, which is short for new out-of-box software. And what's great about this is you get all of these choices at first boot. And then at some point in the future, when you decide you want to use something else or you borked something up and need to start over, you hold down shift at boot and you get this screen back and you get to make another choice. Unlike us who have 47 SD cards and we stick them in various machines to try to figure out what's installed on them at any given time. You have a couple choices to install it. Of course, you can DD at your command line, uh, which is probably what a lot of the people here are inclined to do. There's a handy dandy ARM installer uh, packaged in Fedora and you don't have to use it to install Pydora. You can use it to install all sorts of distros, but it's a one click handy dandy and I'm a big fan of that. Uh, on, a, on a Mac, you can use the Raspberry Pi SD card builder. If you're using Windows, I'm not really sure why you're here, so we'll skip that part. <laughs> or you can just buy a card that is preloaded with a distro. There are several vendors that sell several different distros, usually Raspbian, already on a card, ready for you to go. Uh, and we didn't add, you should probably take into consideration what you're going to do with that, that Pi and how much space you need on said SD card uh, and how big your distro is, for that matter. So power, because, you know, it's electronics, needs electricity, five volts of it. You want to talk about power? Sure. <laughs> so uh, the Pi wants five volts, uh, not less, well, not really more, but just five volts. And, uh, about a quarter volt of tolerance either way. Yeah, it, it is a little bit of wiggle room in there, but the second you start to plug in high-power USB devices, then you discover that you don't have enough power anymore. Uh, but you do want to have this be reliable because the, there's no battery. You might think, hey, I've got this awesome you know, phone, I'm just going to plug my phone charger in there, and what you will discover when you play with this long enough is that most of the phone chargers you've got were cracked. Uh, they're fine for your phone because it doesn't need to hold a continuous great voltage to your phone to charge it. If you go up and down all over the place, your phone will just charge slower. Uh, but for the Pi, you need that to be regular and clean. So uh, your phone charger probably is not the best bet for what you want to do. If you want to go out and get a more dedicated, a little better built uh, charger for this. And the irony is that if you end up getting that, 
We should skip that and see if some conference we can find somebody trying to plug their iPhone connector into a new Pi. Uh, the other comment here is that you can run the Pi off your laptop USB port, but we've seen enough weird random behavior that I really try not to do this. I try to only do it at the Yeah, that said, we have uh, a guy who wrote a section for our book, and I'll show you that in a little bit. And that's all he does. And he came over to my house to spend two Saturdays tinkering on things. And I was like, what are you doing? He's like, this is all I ever powered off of. I was like, all right, whatever works for you. He also, uh, so I have a, a cell phone charger brick. It's about like that big, and it powered the Pi for 16 hours when I forgot that it was on there and running. It's kind of amazing. And uh, mine was, I don't know, like $120 or something a year and a half ago. My mother-in-law gave it to me. Now they're like 40 bucks. My friend, however, he's, he's buying them off this site that's dx.com, which is where he finds all of his amazing little electronics, and he gets them for $15 now. So if you would like portable power, $15 cell phone charger, he gets uh, the smaller ones, he gets five hours off of his, because uh, he's mostly using them for aerial photography, which we'll get to. But yeah, up to 16 hours, kind of insane. And while we're talking about power, we'll talk about this little guy. This is not where you put your thumb to plug your Pi in. That's how you break it off. And that's what you search for when you break it off and want to solder a new one back on. This is cool. Uh, so where those two little pins are that are circled, that is not, those, aren't, those pins aren't on your board. You have to add those two little header pins. But then if you do, you sort of have a power switch. You short those out and your Pi will reboot. Or if it's off, it will power on. Uh, you have a set of LEDs uh, that, that can tell you all sorts of things about why your Pi is not coming on when you think that it should be. And what's super cool about the Pi is you have your GPIO. GPIO stands for General Purpose In Out, if you haven't made friends with it before. This is how most of the super cool projects get made. Um, the pins are slightly different on the older boards, so if, depending, you want to look up what model you have and, and where the pins are and uh, so forth. They're three volt, not five volt like Android, uh, and there's no over voltage protection, so try not to short things out, because that's not cool. Anything else that we should say about the GPIO in general? Uh, the general purpose, all of it can be redesigned to whatever you want, so if one of those pins has a special label, like say I don't really want to use the XT10 for XT10 or something else, you can just give them that their general purpose and just ignore the package there. It's doing something special. And you should buy yourself some male-female jumpers, and I'll show you why when we get to that picture of the horrible, horrible things I've done. This is super handy. This guy created this little thing called the raspberry leaf to lay on there so that uh, you don't have to go crazy trying to figure out which pin is which. And uh, at Open Hardware Summit last week, we got little metal versions of this, which is the best giveaway ever. So uh, the Pi is um, slow, and uh, compiling things on the Pi is uh, really slow. So uh, don't get me wrong, I love the Pi, but you're going to want to build a proper compiler on a uh, faster machine to be able to build things a lot faster. Uh, so uh, Crossbow 1G does this very well. Uh, you can set that up and very quickly have a functioning Monaro compiler pretty optimized to <coughs> the live for the Raspberry Pi. So now that we've uh, said a lot of words that you're going to forget and have to look up again later, let's talk about the cool things people are making with Raspberry Pis because it's for education or grown-ups who want to make fun toys. Uh, we did not talk about cases. You should probably get or make one in some fashion. Uh, lay, leaving them laying all over your dining room table is a good way to get your four-year-old to wander off with one. Not that I know anything like that might happen. Uh, you can 3D print one. In fact, one of the better cases we have came out of the 3D printer. Uh, or you can build them out of Legos, which is my favorite <laughs> approach. Unfortunately, I do not have any dimensionally transcendental Legos, and thus you can't actually travel in that one. Alas. This is, um, this is in the book. This is a good reason. If you like Legos, you should you know, check out the book. Uh, <laughs> this is my diagram of how to take two layers of the little half-height Legos and make a base plate, because a uh, Lego pip, the little, the little round nubbins on top, are 8 millimeters if you do one of the little squares around that. And if you do that by the math of the pie, you need a 9 by 13 base plate to make a case. There is no 9 by 13 base plate. You can make them on like a 15 by 15 or something, but then you don't have a tiny case to go with your tiny pie. Uh, there is also uh, a place that you can buy this handy kit that is already made, but I'm a little Lego obsessive a lot. And at some point I said, do you feel like you go to Target and you're looking at the wall of Lego and 
Death Star is like $500 or something. I'm like, I'm pretty sure my parents were buying me $500 Lego kits. When did Legos get so expensive? And so I actually went back through to the beginning of Legos and priced out price per brick of a bunch of sets since the beginning of time. It turns out Legos are not getting more expensive. They're just cramming a lot more bricks into that box. And so I figured out that 10 cents per brick is the end of this story is a good price. Below 10 cents per brick, you're doing pretty good. This kit, while awesome, is 24 cents per brick. So the whole, it's open source. The directions are online. You can have other colors. You can go make your, your set. You can, uh, Lego Digital Designer is this thing you can download, so you can design it before you build it. You can get little hinge doors so that you can get to the ports. You can get little transparent bricks. So you can get to the LEDs. And now I'll stop talking about Legos. <laughs> we can, I, I should submit a whole talk about Legos one day. <laughs> This is the, the long-awaited, fantastic little camera module. If you haven't seen it, that little, the little green board part of the camera, it's about that big. It is the tiniest, most amazing little, you can dazzle the neighbors. We were in the cul-de-sac with the kids playing the other day, and my neighbors were all like, that's a camera? Like, it takes pictures, like for real. Really? Yeah, it's awesome. Uh, and the coolest thing that I've seen it used for, I'm sorry, Evan, I like your aerial photography picture, but this one's cooler. <laughs> This is the guy I was talking about that's been so super helpful and, and plugs all of his pies into his laptop is with a group called NC Near Space. And they've done uh, seven or eight launches now, I think as high as 80,000 feet. Uh, and so he helped us write about 11 pages worth, I think, about the details of how you do this. And it's pretty spectacular. This is how you should not connect things to the GPIO. <laughs> Unless. In a pinch, you really, really want to, and all you have is some alligator clips. And so what you do, you look very carefully and make sure that nothing's, to metal, no metal touching metal. This is the first thing, uh, one of the first things we came up with when we were like, what can we do with this thing? We can rip a Game Boy apart and shove a pie back in there. That sounds like a good idea. It doesn't really fit that well, as it turns out. It comes pretty close. You gotta start, you gotta dremel out some plastic. It'll get in there, but it's hard work. Also, you need a tri-tip screwdriver to get that thing apart, and I do not have a tri-tip screwdriver. It took us like an afternoon in the Red Hat engineering office to find somebody with a tri-tip screwdriver, but it was worth it. Uh, so this is a little screen that, that Adafruit sells. The other thing that, that I think is fun about being a little pie tinker is that you don't have to read the directions and sometimes things work anyway. <laughs> those, uh, those wires that are so cleverly attached to the pie actually require between six and 12 volts. And that's not supposed to work. But it does, like you can play Tetris all afternoon, and we might have. So if you add, if you add an, extra letter to, little, an extra letter to Pi Boy, what you get is a Pip Boy, uh, if anyone was a Fallout fan. And a lot of people immediately looked at the size of the pie and the size of their arm, not my arm, I have little like child-sized wrists, but other people thought, hey, I could put that on my arm. And so one guy did, he used those, um, if you're familiar with Instamorph or some of the, the products like that, it's little plastic pellets uh, about the size of very small pearls and you put them in hot water and what you get is a clay and you can mold it into anything you want and then it hardens and you have plastic thing that you made. There's something similar now called Sugru, but Sugru co comes already as a clay. You don't have to do the, the heated up part. And so uh, he built this for Halloween last year and shorted it out two hours before the party and then was like, I'm wearing it anyway. It's still pretty cool. This is Tom's favorite project, so I'll let you talk about yeah, so I, I, I'm a gamer at heart, and uh, so the opportunity to turn the pie into a retro gaming system was pretty much what I wanted to do when I heard that for the first time. Uh, there's a thing called Retro Pie that with, has pretty much every emulator known to man on the fucking side of it, and uh, there's a helper script that will automate the entire process. You basically just hit enter and let it go, and it builds all the emulators ever and runs them all on your pie, and most of them run really well. Uh, and you can get uh, a lot of the old uh, joysticks, you can have that authentic experience of playing the same console you played when you were a child. They've taken those, <coughs> off the original connector and converted them over to USB, so they actually show up as USB joysticks. Or if you want that real authentic experience, you can get USB to actual weird proprietary connector connectors and have them use your actual controllers if you're weird like me and save all your games with you forever and ever. Uh, but uh, for a while there, the sound was pretty awful in there because the Alta driver was not so good, but the Alta driver has uh, gotten a lot better lately, and now the sound is pretty much perfect. It can emulate everything. Some of the specific chips in the old devices, uh, the Super Nintendo, the Tetris Archive uh, rendering, that's not going to work in any emulator very well. But uh, Super Metroid has done 
demonstrative here were great. Uh, I've heard reports, although I have yet to try it, that uh, everything all the way up to PlayStation 1 and even some PlayStation 2 games will actually play in real time. We also learned at Maker Faire that 11-year-olds of 2013 are not amused by actual Super Mario 2. Not at all. Child after child came by and would go, can I play Mario? And I'd be like, yeah, you can play Mario, give them the controller. They'd get past barely the first screen and go, your Mario sucks, and throw down the controller and walk away. <laughs> every one of them. Like, this wasn't one kid, it was every kid who walked by. Speaking of kids, let's talk about kids. Since uh, this little thing was made for education, kids are a great creature to educate, I suppose. I think that's, I think that's what we're supposed to do as parents. Yours are still small, there's a chance to recover. Uh, this is a uh, spread from one of my favorite nerd books for kids. It's called Super Scratch Programming Adventure. And if you're not familiar with Scratch, it's uh, th that little cat uh, helps you learn programming skills by those little puzzle pieces at the bottom right. It, they lock together, the pieces of code lock together so that you can actually see how things work. It's pretty cool. And so the way this book works is on the left you have a, a, a comic book story that goes through the book and something happens at the end of the page, and then what you do on the right side in Scratch solves the problem, and at the end of the book, you have a video game you can play. And so the first time I gave this to my daughter, she was, I don't know, five or six, and she poked around in Scratch for a while, and I thought that, I gave her the book, and I thought she was doing stuff, and this is the part where you should be an attentive parent, and then, I don't know, a year later, six months, a year later, she's like, uh, I'm bored, and I said, well, why don't you go use Scratch? And she goes, I don't know how to play that game, and I'm like, it's not a game. Like, you make a game with it. She's like, what? So when you give this book to your kid, you should perhaps help them with it. <laughs> they also have little fingers when you need to plug tiny things into places. <laughs> Another fun, oh, I should add, uh, if you want that book, or Python for Kids is awesome, No Starch loves kids. Uh, and there is a 30% off coupon in your LinuxCon bag for uh, No Starch. They have a whole series of kid books, and we met the founder of the company at Open Hardware Summit last weekend, and he said they're trying to really expand the kid line and, and focus on kids. He's doing some cool stuff in New York with like a sort of temporary weekend hackerspace for kids. Succinct description. This is one of the things that I wanted to do because uh, back in the day I was constantly running SETI at home. Uh, and if you don't remember SETI at home, it basically ran as a screensaver uh, when people use such things and search for alien intelligence, because uh, why not? It, it was the first really big distributed computing project like that. And it has grown up, and there's a new program called BOINC, uh, Berkeley Open Infrastructure Network Computing, I think. And that's what Study at Home runs on now, and so you can set up a Pi to search for aliens. Or you could make a whole Pi farm to search for lots of aliens. And if you did that, you could use a 50 by 50 Lego board and fit like four by... <laughs> this is another interesting project. This is like the, the dedication thing. And this is, you can actually help this guy. So this guy really, really liked Stargate and decided that he wanted a functioning Stargate. Not like functioning, functioning, but functioning. <laughs> not like functioning, functioning. Uh, and so they're making some good progress. This is not, the, this is not theirs, this is the uh, screenshot, but they're making good progress on making the ring, and he wants to use a Raspberry Pi to make things flash and spin and whatnot, and so uh, they're asking for help. So if you want to help him make a Stargate, you should go check that out. He just updated the, the blog. Uh, they've been taking it to like Japan, Comic-Con, and some assorted other events like that to, to show off where they are. PiFM is a, a fun project that turns your Pi into a radio. Uh, it's, so FM stands for frequency modulation. All that means is uh, changing the positive neg to negative signal like 10 million times a second. And uh, your Pi's clock manager can produce any frequency you want by doing math uh, and dividing the system processor clock down to any rate you want. And so these guys took that and basically turn their Pi into a radio, they'll play any sound file you want. And if you want to slightly illegally, depending on your jurisdiction, boost that signal, you can attach a little wire. <laughs> Antenna, as we call it. Anything else cool about that? It's a, it's a cool project. Uh, you should Google Pi FM and check that out. It, 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 it's not going to, you know, it's not going to drown out the radio that you're picking up, by, you know, from your stereo or your car by any means. It's not powerful enough. But uh, it, it, it could be something neat if you wanted to do it for sale by owner and set up so that people are driving by your house to tune their radio to Yeah, the other thing you could do, they've, uh, they've, did you do that? Not too much. Okay. He just sold his house, and I was like, wait, did you do that? 
Uh, the other cool thing that you could use this for if you were willing to do the whole slightly illegal boosting the signal thing is uh, we have another hack in the book that I didn't put in here for doing uh, controlling your Christmas lights with the Pi. You attach a little relay controller and you can control about up to 17 strands if you get enough relays on there. And so then you could, you've seen the Wizards in Winter video where the guy like animated his whole house in lights and all, you could pretty much do that and broadcast it over the radio for people driving by so that you don't torture your neighbors with speakers. <laughs> One of the, the first things, uh, this may be the very first thing we did with the Pi, we set up a photo booth at South by Southwest a long time ago. I don't know, I'm starting to lose track of conferences. And so that's Tom in the penguin suit and me at the monitor. And so we, there's this fun little script and all you have to do is press enter and run it. And it uh, creates this QR code with, it takes the picture, creates the QR code, creates this little web page, and then people can scan the QR code and they get this web page where you tell them about Fedora because there are no ulterior motives here and download their picture with the penguin. And everybody loves a penguin except those same small children who hate Mario and they just want to punch the penguin. I wore the penguin suit for a while at, uh, where was I? Children, like, Lord of the Flies, children swarmed me and started beating me. It was ridiculous. <laughs> so the most recent thing that I started working on uh, is this project. I'm a costuming kind of nerd. And so on the right, that's my Mass Effect Captain Ashley armor. And the guy, if you don't know this game, he probably looks, I realized that at that size, he looks freakishly deformed and not okay. That's the guy who's the voice of the character in the video game, and somebody made him this armor that's half Paragon, half uh, Renegade, and so that's why he looks weird and has yellow contacts. Uh, and so I realized it would be super cool to wire up the camera and a battery pack and put it through a little hole. These costumes are made out of floor mat foam. that's about this thick, that's what that is. And so you just cut a hole in the foam. This is my prototype where I was not so good with the exacto. And you wire up the camera with a continuous stream, and from over there, it looks like there's a hole through me. Uh, this is just a, a brief blurb about XBMC, which we've joked about a couple of times, and, and Evan joked in his talk, too. I think I said something in the preface to the book that like all but one pie has been used for XBMC, because it's all anybody talks about on the internet. But the reason it's a good example is because of this guy. I found down in the comments on uh, a, a post, I think, on the Raspberry Pi blog about, about XBMC, and he's like, I pretty much just opened this box and did it. And I'm like, that's the open source dream! <laughs> it finally worked! And I had my seven-year-old install it the other day. I, she got impatient at the end because it was not being speedy and we got down to let's go ride bikes, but basically a seven-year-old installed XBMC. That's pretty cool. What is not as easy is putting Android on your Pi. This is a really bad idea, and yet a lot of people want to do it. <laughs> there's, a, there's a wiki, they have an IRC channel, there's some people working on it, and it's, it, it will boot and you can use it, and it's the slowest Android you've ever seen in your life. You have to use CyanogenMod 7 to uh, 9 doesn't really work. And uh, if, you, if that is in your aspirations, you just go to the wiki and you do it. Good luck with that. Wow. I wasn't going to do that, but man. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about Arduinos, other words that start with A. Uh, this is a little board called the a la mode, because there's ice cream on your Raspberry Pi. Ha! But what it lets you do is uh, attach Arduino shields to the Pi. And uh, so if you have a collection of Arduino shields sitting around, you're going, sure wish there was an easy way to connect those. Done. Uh, this one's made by uh, Wylam. There's also Cooking Hacks is another site that makes uh, a bunch of stuff for the Pi, and they have a version, too, that's slightly different. This, uh, if, if you're the sort of person who has a spouse who would buy you ancient electronics for your birthday and not get killed, then this would be an excellent Valentine's present. This guy built this for his girlfriend, and it worked, because now she's his wife. It's not just an R2-D2. This is a Raspberry Pi controlled, bilingual, voice controlled, face recognizing, distance recognizing, motion detecting, everything R2-D2. And of course, he records and plays back messages because that's kind of what R2 does. I love that thing, I want one. More tiny gaming, as you can see from the cigarette lighter, ridiculously tiny gaming. That's pretty much what it is. You just have to see that picture because it's just, 
It's adorable. And you can go to the blog, and this is how he describes how he did it. I love his wiring diagrams. He's like, I scribbled this on a napkin and scanned it in for you. Done. Fish Pie is a pretty cool project. Uh, it's a project to build a marine unmanned uh, surface vehicle. They intend for it to cross the Atlantic. This is one of the earlier prototypes. What I love about this is I said you could come up with a case out of Legos or just about anything you want, or say a piece of Tupperware. That's the waterproof housing. I went and looked today to see if they had changed anything. They have a new hole, but it's still in the Tupperware, which I think is awesome. But Tom came up with a better plan if you would like to wet down your pie. No, this is a terrible plan, but it works. I'll let you describe what you did to your electronics. So there's a, there's a paint that came on the market called Never Wet. Uh, Russ Williams is uh, uh, selling it in the United States, and it's extremely hydrophobic. And they say on their website, do not put this on electronics. And so that's the first thing that I did. Was I went to the paint. <laughs> and, I, and I bought Never Wet paint, and I sprayed both layers of paint on just as advertised. No accident just to see what would happen. And then I powered off high and threw it in a bucket of water. And it ran just fine. And, and there's a video of it on YouTube. There's, there's a bad, terrible cell phone video of me doing it. Uh, and then the, the coolest part, though, was when I pulled this out, it came out dry because the water wasn't actually adhering to it at all. It wasn't like it was just not getting in if I let it sit long enough. It comes out in no drips. Now, it makes it very, 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 very chalky. Uh, the one that I painted, which is free painting, but the, uh, the one that I painted is probably worth kept in and, and may look like I left it in the quarry for several years. But, uh, but it was really cool, so we... Uh, it makes it waterproof? I wouldn't say waterproof. I think that, that may be pushing it a bit. I think extremely water resistant for short periods of time is more accurate. So. We were, we were discussing this in uh, one of New Orleans fine restaurants yesterday over lunch, and a guy at the next table was like, excuse me, are you talking about putting your cake in water? <laughs> <laughs> he was highly, and then I heard his wife say something about, there's a girl at that table with five men. What are you talking about? It was hilarious. So then we started talking to that guy. It was great. This is the, the last project I'll show you, uh, and, and it demonstrates another principle, which is that every good idea I have has already been done on the internet. Uh, we, a lot of this book's outline was born in the most wonderful bar in the world in Paris, which if you're the kind of person who would like to walk into a bar and see a Millennium Falcon on the wall, then this is your bar, and I'll tell you all about it. You just come up after, and you can hear the saga of the greatest bar in the world. But one of the things they have is these old things, which I call the Pizza Hut table, because that's the only place I ever saw them, where you have the player one on one side and player two on the other, and it flips back and forth, and you can play all games. And I'm like, we could build this with a pie and Ikea and stuff. And then, of course, I Google it, and somebody already built it, because every good idea I have, somebody already did on the internet, but still want to do it. And that's about it. If you would like to download, uh, not exactly these slides, but a previous version of them. <laughs> They're at that link at the top. Uh, it's mostly missing just that uh, aerial photography picture, but I'll upload the new ones so that you can have them. And then uh, these are some other resources. The Beginner's Guide is good if, if you're just getting started. That's the link for our book that comes out in December and our information so that you can yell at us on the internet. Anybody have any questions? Cool projects they want to tell us about? Did you bring beer from your Raspberry Pi beer kegerator? 15 minutes away. Sweet. Go now. All right, well, thanks for coming. Oh, yeah. Uh, you mean in the sense of power? Basically, what it means is that uh, you, the USB port on your laptop 
I also forgot to add, I have uh, not a ton, but I have some Pydora t-shirts, if anybody wants one, and a, all the Pydora stickers in the entire world, and possibly some Raspberry Pi stickers, I should look. Yeah. Oh, so the, um, the picture that I showed from the near Earth orbit photography, they actually had three cameras on board. They had the Raspberry Pi one, they had, uh, uh, wasn't a Lumix, maybe it was a Lumix, but something, you know, point and shoot of that size, and then this um, sort of cylinder camera uh, that we're all running through the USB. All right, thanks for coming.